From some on the right, I expect we'll hear a different argument that if we just make fewer investments in our people. Extend tax cuts including those for the wealthier Americans. Eliminate more regulations, maintain the status quo on health care, our deficits will go. Away. The problem is that's what we did for eight years. That's what helped us into this crisis. It's what helped lead to these deficits. We can't do it again. Rather than fight the same tired battles that have dominated Washington for decades. It's time to try something new. Let's invest in our people without leaving them a mountain of debt. Let's meet our responsibility to the citizens who sent us here. Let's try common sense a novel concept. Now, to do that we have to recognize that we face more than a deficit of dollars right now. We face a deficit of trust deep and corrosive doubts. About how Washington works that have been growing for years. To close that credibility gap we have to take action on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue to end the outsized influence of lobbyists to do our work openly to give our people the government they deserve Now, that's what I came to Washington to do. That's why, for the first time in history, my administration posts on our White House visitors online. That's why we've excluded lobbyists from policy-making jobs, or seats on federal boards and commissions. But... We can't stop there. It's time to require lobbyists to disclose each contact they make on behalf of a client.
with my administration or with Congress. It's time to put strict limits on the contributions that lobbyists give to candidates for federal office. With all due deference to separation of powers, last week the Supreme Court reversed. A century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests. Including foreign corporations to spend without limit in our elections. I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by. America's most powerful interests or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people. And I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that helps to correct some of these problems. I'm also calling on Congress to continue down the path of earmark reform Democrats and Republicans. Democrats and Republicans. Look, you've trimmed some of this spending. You've embraced some meaningful change. But restoring the public trust demands more. For example, some members of Congress post some earmark requests online. Tonight, I'm calling on Congress to publish all earmark requests on a single website before there's a vote. so that the American people can see how their money is being spent. Of course, none of these reforms will even happen if we don't also reform how we work with one another. Now, I'm not naive. I never thought that the mere fact of my election would usher in peace and harmony, and some post-partisan era. I knew that both parties have fed divisions that are deeply entrenched.
and on some issues, there are simply philosophical differences that will always cause us to part ways. These disagreements, about the role of government in our lives. About our national priorities and our national security, they've been taking place for over 200 years. They're the very essence of our democracy. But what frustrates the American people is a Washington where every day is election day. We can't wage a perpetual campaign where the only goal is to see who can get the most embarrassing headlines about the other side a belief that if you lose, I win. One neither party should delay or obstruct every single bill just because they can. The confirmation of I'm speaking to both parties now the confirmation of well-qualified public servants. shouldn't be held hostage to the pet projects or grudges of a few individual senators. Washington may think that saying anything about the other side. No matter how false, no matter how malicious, is just part of the game. But it's precisely such politics that has stopped either party from helping the American people. Worse yet, it's sowing further division among our citizens, further distrust in our government. So, no, I will not give up on trying to change the tone of our politics. I know it's an election year. And after last week, it's clear that campaign fever has come even earlier then. Usual. But we still need to govern. To Democrats, I would remind you that we still have the largest majority in decades. And the people expect us to solve problems, not run for the hills.
and if the Republican leadership is going to insist that 60 votes in the Senate are required to do any. Business at all in this town a supermajority then the responsibility to govern is now yours as well. Just saying no to everything may be good short-term politics, but it's not leadership. We were sent here to serve our citizens, not our ambitions. So let's show the American people that we can do it together. This week, I'll be addressing a meeting of the House Republicans. I'd like to begin monthly meetings with both Democratic and Republican leadership. I know you can't wait. Now, throughout our history, no issue has united this country more than our security. Sadly, some of the unity we felt after September 11th has dissipated. Now, we can argue all we want about who's to blame for this. But I'm not interested in relitigating the past. I know that all of us love this country. All of us are committed to its defense. So let's put aside the schoolyard taunts about who is tough. Let's reject the false choice between protecting our people and upholding our values. Let's leave behind the fear and division. And do what it takes to defend our nation and forge a more hopeful future for America and for the world. That's the work we began last year. Since the day I took office, we've renewed our focus on the terrorists who threaten our nation. We've made substantial investments in our homeland security. And disrupted plots that threatened to take American lives.
we are filling unacceptable gaps revealed by the failed Christmas attack. With better airline security and swifter action on our intelligence. We prohibited torture and strengthened partnerships from the Pacific to South Asia to the Arabian Peninsula. And in the last year, hundreds of Al Qaeda's fighters and affiliates. including many senior leaders, have been captured or killed far more than in 2008. And in Afghanistan, we're increasing our troops and training Afghan security forces so They can begin to take the lead in July of 2011, and our troops can begin to come home. We will reward good governance, work to reduce corruption. and support the rights of all Afghans men and women alike. We're joined by allies and partners who have increased their own commitments. and who will come together tomorrow in London to reaffirm our common purpose. There will be difficult days ahead. But I am absolutely confident we will succeed. As we take the fight to Al-Qaeda, we are responsibly leaving Iraq to its people. As a candidate, I promised that I would end this war, and that is what I am doing as president. We will have all of our combat troops out of Iraq by the end of this August. We will support the Iraqi government as they hold elections. And we will continue to partner with the Iraqi people to promote regional peace and prosperity. But make no mistake, this war is ending, and all of our troops are coming home. Tonight, all of our men and women in uniform in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and around the world.
have to know that they have our respect, our gratitude, our full support. And just as they must have the resources they need in war. We all have a responsibility to support them when they come home. That's why we made the largest increase in investments for veterans in decades last year. That's why we're building a 21st century VA. And that's why Michelle has joined with Jill Biden to forge a national commitment to support military families. Now, even as we prosecute two wars. We're also confronting perhaps the greatest danger to the American people the threat of nuclear weapons. I've embraced the vision of John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan through a strategy. That reverses the spread of these weapons and seeks a world without them. To reduce our stockpiles and launchers, while ensuring our deterrent. The United States and Russia are completing negotiations on the farthest reaching arms control treaty in nearly two decades. And at April's nuclear security summit, we will bring 44 nations together here in Washington. DC behind a clear goal, securing all vulnerable nuclear materials around the world in four years. So that they never fall into the hands of terrorists. Now, these diplomatic efforts have also strengthened our hand in dealing with those. Nations that insist on violating international agreements in pursuit of nuclear weapons. That's why North Korea now faces increased isolation and stronger. Sanctions sanctions that are being vigorously enforced. That's why the international community is more united and the Islamic Republic of Iran is more isolated.
and as Iran's leaders continue to ignore their obligations, there should be no doubt. They, too, will face growing consequences. That is a promise.